Mm. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is um, Jens Schmidt speaking, and it's yeah. my true pleasure and honor to speak to you today um, in this TMA's Medical Advisory Board town hall meeting on polymyositis and necrotizing myopathy. Um, together with me is um, a distinguished a panel of um, medical advisors. Um, with me is Will Jajua, Eric um, Ensrud. Um, we're still missing Olivier Benvenist. Um, Adam Schittenbauer is with us and Marlene um, Marigard. Um, each of us will briefly introduce um, him or herself, um, and then we will go into this discussion with all of you. And um, I would uh, very much encourage you to um, ask questions either through the chat mode or um, by using your microphone, raising your hand. Um, so very briefly about my um, own position. I have a, a dual position. Um, I'm based in Germany, um, in Göttingen, um, and in Rüdersdorf, which is close to Berlin. I'm um, a neurologist by training, and I'm um, head of the university hospital in um, the medical school Brandenburg. The expertise and interest is on uh, myositis pathology. So we use different cell culture um, systems um, and look for mechanisms of autophagy, cell stress, and um, different immune cascades. In a more clinical setting, we're interested in novel real-time um, MRI applications um, for the use of diagnostics um, for impairment of swallowing and breathing. And we're involved in various clinical studies in patients with myositis and also um, neuromuscular um, conditions such as neuropathies um, or other uh, myopathies. Um, I would now hand over um, to Well Jajou and um, we would like to hear your um, background, please, Well. Uh, thank you, Jens. Uh... I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and to talk to you, be it virtual. Uh, I'm a rheumatologist at Ohio State University. I, uh, my uh, interest is in myositis and I see patients uh, with a variety of, of inflammatory myopathies. Uh, I also have a research lab that um, has a major focus on myositis. Uh, our interest is in developing new strategies for treatment that did not include immunosuppression. So um, we are looking at uh, certain autoantibodies that affect the cell membrane and compromise the cell membrane and results in the, uh, essentially the cells not remain intact in patients with myositis. And um, so we are developing strategies that will allow the membrane to reseal itself therefore reducing the flow of antigens that could be stimulating the immune system to uh, function uh, in an adverse way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. Um, then I would like to welcome Eric Ensrud um, to introduce himself, please. Uh, hi, I'm Eric Ensrud. I'm a neurologist. I'm also a physiatrist or a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And I'm at the um, University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, my particular interest is in the use of exercise and rehabilitation in neuromuscular disorders, including myositis. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, and I believe we, we're still missing Olivier. Am I right? I don't hear or see him, unfortunately. Um, so we will um, go over to um, Adam Schiffenbauer. Please introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Adam Schiffenbauer. I'm an adult rheumatologist over at the National Institutes of Health. Um, we have a research group over here working on a variety of different aspects of myositis um, across the spectrum of IBM, DM, uh, PM, and necrotizing myopathy um, with a particular focus on genetic and environmental risk factors for the development of myositis. Uh, we currently have 
uh, several ongoing studies looking at imaging and uh, diagnostic criteria, um, and particularly a drug study looking at the treatment of calcinosis uh, in myositis patients. Thank you very much. And um, as this list uh, is an opposite uh, um, order, unfortunately, uh, the uh, female participant is listed last. Uh, I'm very sorry for this. Um, so please, uh, Marlene Rigard, please introduce yourself. Oh, hello. My name is Marlene Rigard, and I'm an occupational therapist and a researcher at the Karolinska University Hospital in Sweden. I also am affiliated to the Karolinska Institute. Uh, and I work with all types of myositis. Uh, my research have been on activity limitation and hand function in poly and dermatomyositis, and also inclusion body myositis. I have a special interest in patient reported outcome measures, and it's part of the OMER Act, which is um, uh, working on to see what to measure to evaluate the effect on clinical trials and, and, uh, and, and uh, clinical evaluations. And I think maybe a few of you have answered questionnaires from us to see what is important for you. Uh, I'm also part of a study group in IMAX that are developing exercise guidelines. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very glad also to be here, even though it's Saturday night in Sweden. So, but it's nice to be with you. Yes. So thank you very much, Martin. And um, thank you, everybody. Um, I think it's um, self-explanatory that this is a very um, distinguished a board of experts. Um, I took the liberty to, um, if this works somehow, um, to maybe to start um, some seeding points for um, a, um, a discussion, to maybe think of some challenges that uh, could occur in polymyositis or immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Um, for example, in terms of diagnostic criteria, there are different criteria used um, and uh, hopefully at least one of them is being used. So which one is the best, which one is right? Um, then in terms of autoantibodies, um, is a test available for an individual patient and is the test reliable? Regarding the treatment, um, what can we do if the standard treatment fails and then subsequently if the escalation treatment um, fails? Um, or if we have a complete treatment failure, is maybe the diagnosis wrong? Um, do we need to think of genetic testing? Um, could this even be um, a nerve or motor neuron disorder? And then I think, um, particularly with um, the experts we have together, with, um, we truly have an interdisciplinary panel here. Um, and I think this is um, um, ec really excellent. This is how I think um, my scientist treatment should work. I think um, in, in view of the different organs that can be involved, um, the care should really be interdisciplinary. Um, but the question is, are all the required spe specialists really available um, in um, all places? So without further ado, I would um, welcome participants um, to ask questions. And I would stop the presentation mode so we would hopefully be able to see ourselves a little bit bigger. Um, so I think all of us do see the chat and I would read, I would start with the first, it's a long question um, regarding yoga assessment tools, myositis activities, MAP, MMI, question on the drug, Zirolimus. My rheumatologist has prescribed two milligrams per day. 
um, on an experimental basis to treat IBM following the findings in Dr. Ben Benist's phase um, so-and-so trial. Can you give a simplified description of what the drug does in the body and how it may stop muscle um, atrophy in patients? Um, also, uh, what changes in function? And um, if I can expect or hope for in my response to the drug and how long does it take for these changes to appear. Um, now, the question is if one of us would like to answer this, um, obviously this um, would not be the perfect panel because we also have an IBM panel, uh, but I'm sure that um, some of us are familiar with this topic. Um, so would one of us comment on the use of um, serolimus? Um, I mean, we have um, internal medicine, rheumatology experts here. So um, some of you have used serolimus before. Sure, I, I'm. So I'm. I, I would send this to the IBM panel and see what they they say as well. But it, the idea is, sir, it falls within the immunosuppressive regimens that we've used for other medications. Uh, with the idea being that serolimus targets different types of cells on the the T cell type. So it's not just, it's still suppressing your immune system, but theoretically doing it in a better way. And by selecting for particular cells, helping to make it more effective in how it's working. Um, I think in terms of whether it works or not, that's why we have a clinical study going on um, to work right now on figuring out whether this is really gonna be successful in IBM or not. Uh, I think it's too early to say whether it's a success or not at this point. Uh, but certainly we are looking for anything we can find that will help treat IBM for patients. Thank you very much, um, Adam. Um, any additions from any other panelists? This does not seem to be the case. Maybe um, I skipped the first lines on yoga assessment tools, um, MAP, MMI. Um, would maybe one of you like to comment on um, these issues? For example, yoga or assessment tools? I guess it depends on what the question is. Yoga, I cannot anything about. Assessment tools, I've been, we've been trying to find out what is important to measure in the OMRAC, and we have discovered that um, despite um, maybe the most common, commonly expected symptom like muscle function is, um, is part of it, but also pain and fatigue. Uh, which is also interesting. So we're trying to find out how to measure these. And I guess MAP is the Myositis Activities Profile, which is, was developed by Helena Alexanderson, which is a colleague of mine, a physiotherapist and researcher. MMI, I don't really know what it is. <laughs> and, and regarding yoga, do you, I mean, we, we know some data on myositis um, from, um, the physiotherapy, we um, know um, your institutions work on this, and we know the positive effects um, of um, and physiotherapy, mm -hmm. that it's one of the mainstays of treatment for patients mm -hmm. with myositis, and that we should not wait, we should apply physiotherapy right away, because in very old mm -hmm. textbooks, it, uh, still, uh, it is, it's, it's still quoted that initially we should be very careful and uh, the patient should uh, just uh, receive rest, which is not true, as we know today. So mm -hmm. do we know anything about yoga? I'm not aware of any data. Me neither. I can't say that there isn't any, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, so the studies that I've gone through in the in the IMAX that we are trying to to find out the exercise guidelines, I can't remember that we had anything on yoga. Uh, but I wouldn't take poison. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm unaware of anything being published specifically in yoga. There have been at least a couple of studies on yoga and inflammation, looking at inflammatory markers and their change in responses to a yoga program that um, have shown positive results. So uh, it, it seems like the idea of yoga helping an inflammatory myopathy 
there is some, you know, reasonable physiologic and scientific basis to that, certainly. Thank you. So I think this answers the presumed question very well. Um, there is another question, um, and I take the liberty to read it out. I have had polymyositis since 2014. I'm now on four milligram prednisone, methotrexate once a week, and um, a rutuxin infusion every six months. Is this sustainable amount um, of drugs? I feel okay, but feel like it's a ton of medication. Would anybody like to answer that? I'm happy to take that one. Um, so, so treatment of my myositis is very individualized. And so, what I'm saying are general rules and that applies for patients that I've seen, and and it, it, it depends on the particular individual how far you can go. So, the goal is always to try to taper the medication to the lowest possible dose that. It sustains the patient in remission, and that's the goal. So, so usually, what I try to do is I, I sort of, in discussion with the patient, I, I we make a decision about which drug we're going to try to taper further. So, the rituximab, the tapering for rituximab in my clinic is I space the infusions further and further apart, and so that sometimes patients can have a, a rituximab infusion once a year, and that's sufficient to maintain them in remission. That's obviously better than taking it every six months. Um, as far as the metrexate also, it's another drug that can be tapered very slowly and carefully with reassessment to make sure there's no flare. Uh, the, the amount of prednisone you're on is, is very small and, and there are patients who stay on that kind of dose of prednisone long-term. But uh, the issue here is you taper one medication at a time and you just watch the patient carefully to make sure they don't flare. And yes, this is a lot of medicine. I, uh, unfortunately, sometimes it, a lot of medicine is required to maintain somebody in remission long-term. Thank you, Will. Would anybody like to add anything? I think this was an, an excellent answer. And this is um, um, how I would personally also um, see this, that um, it's really a very individual um, decision. So the next would be, what are your thoughts on tapering prednisone after five milligrams? Continue a slow taper or just discontinue? That's a straightforward question. Would anybody like to answer that? I think in a group of, if you got five my size experts together for this, you can get 10 different answers. Um, <laughs> I, I think it depends on the patient. For us, it depends on the patient and what, how, what their disease symptoms are. And a patient who has real severe interstitial lung disease um, and has residual damage from that, I'm a lot more careful about tapering that low-dose prednisone than in somebody who had some mild skin disease, you know, as their main symptom and didn't have anything else really going on. Um, physiologically, five milligrams tapering it after that point really should have no effect, but we see patient after patient who really does well at three and does poorly at two um, when it, it doesn't, make medical sense that that really should be happening for them. Um, so we still taper slowly. I think the big thing is we know the risks of the prednisone are much lower when you get to that five and below. So it's more comfortable being on those doses for a longer period of time if that's where an uh, individual patient has to sit to control their disease. What about an alternating regimen to have, for example, one day five milligrams and then skip and then um, have five again. This is common in, in several countries. Um, what about um, the habits in the US? Maybe would um, someone like to comment on this? So, so I, I use that regimen, but even, even if somebody's taking five milligrams and I want to get them to an every other day regimen, I would use a, a slow taper down. And, and uh, like Adam said, the, the, uh, the, the fact that there are patients who flare when you're giving them uh, five, I mean, they're doing fine on five milligrams. You go down to four milligrams and they flare. It makes no sense. And when I was a much, much more younger, uh, I used to say, ah, so what? We, we taper them very quickly and should be fine. We just get them off the prednisone. But uh, actually, a matter of fact, it, 
I learned over the years that you really need to individualize even that paper. And, but I, we do use that regimen. So uh, five milligrams every other day is way better than five milligrams every day. So if we can get patients on every other day regimen, we do it. Yes, absolutely. Great, great. Especially in my so, Great, so thank you. Um, the next question would be, are there any new treatments on the horizon for NAM, so NIM or IMNM? So the silence is, um, this is a challenge, um, necrotizing uh, myositis. Um, many experts start with um, a intense um, dual um, a treatment, for example, uh, rituximab um, steroids or immunoglobulins and steroids, um, and then um, one form of um, immunosuppression like um, methotrexate or azathioprine. And um, this really is a challenge. Um, the disease is rare, and um, I think we now see an advancement, for example, that um, clinical studies um, have um, identified a, a new way of treatment in dermatomyositis, um, and hopefully we will see similar um, new studies also in other subsets of um, um, myositis, for example, antisynthetase syndrome and necrotizing um, myopathy. I think this is much needed. Would anybody like to add any comment regarding this topic on necrotizing myopathy and new treatments? I would just say, I think we're seeing there are some starting up, some I know Karolinska and, and Hector Chinoy over at Manchester a baricinib study, but I think we're seeing, we'll, we'll be seeing a bunch of JAK inhibitor studies. Um, and a lot of them don't discriminate for the necrotizing myopathies, I think outside of their inclusion criteria for who can get into those studies. It's I am uh, by the ACR ULAR criteria, which a lot of those people will fulfill. Um, so I think they'll certainly be in some of those cohorts for the JAK inhibitor studies, as far as I've seen their inclusion criteria. Would you like um, um, maybe add a comment uh, because someone is asking um, regarding uh, the recruitment and the possibility to join a clinical study in necrotizing myopathy. Uh, it's not our study. So I can do, I think, you know, in general, TMA's website does a good job of presenting when new studies start recruiting individuals on the adult side. And then at least in the US clinicaltrials.gov and looking for myositis, which will get you lots of clinical trials, are sort of where I'd recommend uh, yeah. people go for looking. And maybe, um, maybe my, I may add um, that um, as a patient, um, one thinks that if there is a new study, all patients should have access to the new drug. Um, now, this often is a true challenge for us um, in the study centers, because there are very many um, inclusion and exclusion criteria which are necessary in order to make the study as safe as possible. So unfortunately, even though the label seems to be right, that the diagnosis is true, um, there may be um, individual factors present in, a, in an individual patient which would present uh, prevent, sorry, prevent uh, uh, study inclusion. Um, so I think um, you're absolutely right, Adam, in suggesting to um, screen clinicaltrials.gov, um, screening TMA's uh, website and other um, um, websites from um, the big study sites and then reach out to um, the local physician, the local uh, myositis center, speak to them. Usually um, a good myositis center would know which study would be applicable and could potentially um, be um, able to take on um, a patient, even if that patient is not from the own center. So this would be the way to go, I think. And please don't be disappointed 
if physicians say that you're not suitable for a um, study, um, this is often for a, um, a very specific cause, for example, certain um, um, criteria, certain um, 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 diagnosis like uh, cancer or certain changes in um, the, the blood works, for example. So the next um, would be, what, if any, new treatments or medications are being used to treat polymyositis for difficult cases? So this is a very broad question. Would like to tackle that. So I would go back. I think the newest one people are using, uh, and new is always relative, is I think the JAK inhibitor medications across the board here. Um, it's probably the, the newest large scale use of a, a medication for the in myositis. Um, yeah. Another question, are there any promising clinical trials with new medications? And this again is also a very broad question. Um, I think we've already touched upon this. Um, and yes, there are, um, which is, I think, um, a very, very good um, thing that we have so many clinical trials um, coming up um, and there will be more coming up in um, the coming years, um, which is extremely important. And hopefully um, some of these trials will reveal new positive um, results so that ultimately we will have um, more um, possibilities in uh, treatment escalation. I think it will be a challenge for us to um, go into specifics uh, for the different monoclonals. There are um, different cascades, different um, antibodies um, tackling um, adhesion molecules, attacking um, T cells, B cells. Um, changing the immuno um, response, uh, changing regulatory cells. So I think it will be beyond a discussion in a panel uh, like today um, as to really being able to go into detail. Um, would maybe one of you, um, one of the panelists like to go into more details maybe on um, the one or the other drug or the one or the other um, component for the future? Anything very promising? Then maybe we should go to the next question. What are your thoughts on blood flow restriction exercise in myositis? What if you have Reynolds as well? This is an interesting uh, area that there have been, um, uh, you know, some examination of this and research in this blood uh, flow restriction exercise. Uh, the last TMA patient summit, I gave a talk on this or a talk on exercise that included this and uh, some of the papers. Um, the TMA should have this available. Um, if not, please contact me directly and I'll get that um, PowerPoint to you. Um, uh, there, there is some, you know, as I mentioned, there's some good information on this. I think there are definitely some drawbacks as well. Um, it, um, it's difficult to do in more than one limit at a time. Um, there is some discomfort involved. I actually had this done to me through a physical therapist friend prior to the talk so I could better describe to patients what is involved with this. And um, uh, I would say it's a little more than the average exercise related discomfort. I don't mean to discourage anyone, but um, uh, you know, it's good to go in it with eyes open. It's if you have someone a physical therapist um, that's doing this. Um, 
in uh, the center that you receive your treatment, it would be worthwhile to meet with them and discuss it and you know, consider giving it a trial. I think um, this particular person who has Raynaud's as well, um, that could make it a little more difficult because that's a vascular, you know, a blood flow restriction that I'm unaware of anything published on uh, blood flow restriction exercise worsening rain nodes, but it seems logical that it would or could potentially. So it would depend on, you know, if you were having it done, say, for example, on a leg uh, for the purpose of the benefit, but you tend to get rain nodes in your hands, uh, then that, for example, might be uh, better tolerated. Thank you. This is indeed very interesting, and I'm sure this was an extremely helpful um, answer. Thank you very much, um, Eric. Anybody would like to add anything? I don't see that that's. The I guess. Case. I mean, I guess also yes, in please, the in the purpose of uh, making it possible to exercise. I mean, it's important to to do it regularly, and I guess this is time consuming, and you need your physio, and you need the. Uh, the expertise of this flow, blood flow restriction. So, uh, of course, you have to weigh in how much, how much effort it is, also with the discomfort. But yeah, but still, to exercise is important. Thank you. So let's go on with the next um, question. Um, with PM, we treated my flares with increased prednisone and watched CK. Now that I know I have NM does CK still have a relevance? So that means someone had PM and now the, the new diagnosis is necrotizing myopathy. Does this make any difference in terms of um, monitoring CK? Would anybody like to answer that? Okay. Um, so, I mean, the CK is a, is a is a useful tool, but it's not a uh, tell-all. So we have patients that we treat with both polymyositis or necrotizing myopathy, where we, 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 we have definite evidence that they're in remission, but they have a persistently elevated CK. And on the other hand, there are patients who have normalized their CK, but we still have other evidence to support that they still have active myopathy. So, so essentially, the CK is a guideline, but really it's not the most definitive way to say somebody has active inflammation in their muscle or not. So we rely on other tools to tell us that. Absolutely. Like MRI and neuroconduction yeah. study and EMG and things like that. Absolutely. I would fully agree with uh, what you said, uh, that um, CK is an interesting parameter, but surely it doesn't tell everything. And um, if the patient feels well and everything is clinically stable, if it's only the, the CK, which hasn't dropped as um, you might have expected it would uh, need to drop, uh, then um, I think one should not be uh, too worried, and um, I think the, the clinical effect is uh, much more relevant than the CK. I'm fully with you. I think this is a, a very important message. Um, the next, um, from the Zoom discussion, I was diagnosed with NAM with SRP antibodies. I immediately started IVIG Gammaplex last year in June for six months. I relapsed in June 21. It can no longer bend at all with my legs, quads, and has pretty much left me bedridden. I started a new infusion, we took them up on the 2nd of September. I go back Monday for my second um, infusion. Will I be able to regain my mobility ever? How long after the second infusion will it take for me to start to regain some strength? I'm also on 60 milligrams of prednisone daily. This is a very individual, very challenging um, treatment situation. Who would like to comment on that? Sure, so I think, you know, our goal for everybody with my size is to try and get them as, as much strength back as they can. Um, and 
but particularly with the necrotizing myopathy like SRP, where there can be a lot of damage, where we have more medications now than we used to for sure to treat activity, uh, but damage still remains one of those issues that is hard to treat. And um, some of the imaging modalities like an MRI to look at how much damage is in the muscle and fatty replacement versus how much of this is activity can give you an idea of where your strength can come back to. They don't match up. We have patients who have MRIs that are quite severe lucky who have very good strength and vice versa, but it can give you some idea about where your goal may lie. Um, but SRP is one of those antibodies that does more damage up front. So it's one where um, more of that weakness is likely to be damaged and harder to get back. Um, but the goal should always be to get as much strength back as possible and certainly exercise on top of the therapy with the medications is helpful there. Thank you, Adam. Anybody likes to add something? So we, we could um, move back to the QA uh, window um, with the next question, which is also very challenging. With our current knowledge and pretty advanced technology, in your opinion, you think, how long will it take us to find a cure? Five years from now, 10 years, 20 years. I see some of you smiling. This is a challenge. And of course, it's um, um, a projection question. I can start. Uh, so, so part of, I mean, this is a great question. Obviously, this is a, pay, a question that every patient uh, has in their mind because obviously it was their experience. So, so the, the difficulty with these diseases is, is as we learn more and more about them, we realize that inflammatory myopathies are now one disease, but many diseases lumped together. And while we make, may find actually what we can define as a cure for one subtype within the next 10 years, there will probably be others that we will not find a cure within 10 years. So, so hopefully, I mean, we are advancing in a rapid pace uh, in our, uh, the way we treat people with inflammatory myopathies, but, but we definitely will not use the term cure. And again, cure nowadays, the people who do very, very well are most of the time on some drug regimen. We like to use as little medicine as possible of any kind, but most folks are on some medication to maintain them in remission. So the term we like to use is remission more than a cure. Uh, but but uh, we look we all do research with the goal with one goal in mind is to cure some of these diseases so the patients don't have to be on any medicine but uh, that's something that's for the future for sure. Um, yeah, I fully I, agree. Yeah. Um, so I I always compare it to um, other. So I think at first um, we should. Uh, acknowledge that myositis is a chronic condition. And I think it would be good um, to accept this as something that um, can go on for the rest of the life. Um, some patients are lucky that uh, they get a very good remission and a very good um, symptom control, but it's very unusual that the disease walks away completely. Um, it's more like in diabetes, hypertension, um, we also need long-term, lifelong um, treatment. Um, and it's just a matter of dosing and mixing different tablets. So the same holds true for um, many inflammatory diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory muscle disease, and other conditions. And I think this is important to bear in mind. So I, um, I fully agree with the uh, whale that um, we uh, probably will not be able to find a definite cure for these disease, but still um, we, it, it could be possible that um, the majority of patients will have good symptom control and stay in remission for a long time with minimal side effects. So this should be the primary goal. Anybody likes to add anything? Everybody's nodding, so maybe we can move on. Um, regarding tapering 
five milligrams is every other day applicable for NM or just PMDM. Maybe we can um, have it um, quickly. Of course, I think there is uh, not much difference between the different subsets of myositis. So uh, the, um, we have discussed tapering um, quite extensively and the other every other day application um, could be a feasible um, opportunity um, and would apply for um, any subset of myositis if the clinician in charge would uh, make this decision. Any additions? No, I mean, I, I think that's right. It doesn't, whatever the subset is, it, it doesn't. I think we've seen, because um, we're a referral center, so we see patients come in all different regiments, and we certainly see people in alternating regiments who do fine, uh, but we do see people who, you know, have changes in their symptoms day to day when they, they're on alternating regiments. Um, so it is not for everybody as well, that there are some people who just don't tolerate the the every other day regimen, they need something more stable for their, their treatment. Yeah. Maybe the next question from Zoom again, um, have polymyositis and um, unable to take prednisone due to severe osteoporosis and have discrete lupus and Sjogren's and only 49 years old, have tried methotrexate, IVIG and now trying rituxan. Not seeing improvement in weakness, specialists are wondering if have IBM instead scheduling appetite with genetics for testing. Um, no, not appetite, um, appointment with genetics for testing. Have not had a muscle biopsy. Do you recommend one? Also have been told getting MRIs of muscles may be helpful also. Any recommendations are welcome. So this again is, um, an individual difficult uh, treatment situation with um, a combination of um, um, different treatment modalities. Who would like to comment on this? So I think it's not uncommon that we see patients who are diagnosed one way, started on therapy, and when they don't respond as well as people think they should, that the diagnosis comes back to question. Um, particularly if they don't have a biopsy up front that's very consistent with one of the types of myositis. Um, the two most common ones are we have our DM patients where the rash isn't well documented and people question whether it was really a DM rash or something else, or polymyositis patients who don't get better and they think about IBM or overlying disease. Um, the muscle biopsy is always hard in this because if it's normal, you don't know whether it's partially treated disease or whether it is uh, really normal muscle. Um, MRI guided biopsy certainly is more helpful there. And then the pattern of weakness. Um, you know, really we put a lot of stake in the pattern of weakness uh, for evaluating IBM versus some of these other disorders. And it tells you a lot about at least inside of myositis, what category you're going to fall into uh, on exam. Yeah, I think um, you raised an important point that doing a biopsy as the patient receives treatment is quite a challenge because um, ideally um, we would ask that before a biopsy is, is um, performed that in a given time frame before that biopsy, and this is a, a difficult decision, how long should this time frame be? Ideally, the um, immunosuppression should be paused um, but many patients would not be able to tolerate this pausing of um, uh, treatment. So this is a difficult um, situation. And this would um, bring us back to the um, initial discussion that um, we think diagnosis is important in first place. And even if the diagnosis seems to be very straightforward just by the clinical picture and just by antibodies, um, I personally, I still think that um, a biopsy is not only interesting in terms of um, academic interest and in terms of pathomechanistic insights. I think it could, for the long term, also help um, to tackle such individual situations um, sometimes further down the road if the diagnosis after one or two years of treatment. Um, seems to be unsure, then a biopsy, even if it's uh, a year back, um, could still be helpful. So um, 
I would like anybody else to maybe um, add to this or any other aspects. But uh, yeah, just in terms of that question, what um, Adam was mentioning about the pattern of weakness when it becomes a question of polymyositis or inclusion body myositis. Most patients with inclusion body myositis have a very typical distribution of muscles that are effective and it's pretty unique. For example, in the front of the thigh, there's a group of muscles called the quadriceps. And the main ones are on the lateral side or the outside of the thigh called the vastus lateralis. And then the one on the inside of the thigh called the vastus medialis. But there's a couple of muscles that run right down the center of the thigh, in particular, one called the rectus femoris. And for unknown reasons, that muscle tends to be relatively well-preserved in patients who have IBM. And you can see that on MR MRI imaging, which is one reason MRI imaging of the thigh can be helpful in making the diagnosis of um, inclusion body myositis versus polymyositis. The other thing that tends to happen in the arms is that the, at least initially, how the arms are affected tends to be pretty asymmetric or not equal from side to side. And particular muscles that get affected are what's called the flexor pollicis longus. And that muscle pulls the tip of the thumb down like that. I'm, I'm activating, I'm trying to keep it in front of my face so it doesn't, the flexor pollicis longus. And then the muscles that pull the tip of the finger down, that's called the flexor digitorum profundus or FDP. And those muscles tend to be affected to a much greater extent that with more severe inclusion body myositis, you get a hand that looks somewhat, just trying to do that like this because the tips of the fingers aren't pulling down well and the tip of the thumb's not pulling down well. So for that reason, MRIs of muscles of the forearm or the thighs can certainly be helpful in trying to differentiate or make a, dis, uh, a more distinct uh, diagnosis between polymyositis and inclusion body myositis. Thank you very much. Uh, this was, I'm very sure this was um, extremely helpful. Um, Maybe in the chat again. It is common for myositis patients to be misdiagnosed with type of myositis. I was initially diagnosed with dermatomyositis and now have been changed to polymyositis. Um, I think this is not uncommon. Um, this, um, have, this will have many reasons. Um, it can be the same physician, the same team, um, and different features of the disease may come up um, so that, um, or maybe new testings, new antibodies um, come up so that the diagnosis um, is changed um, retrospectively. And yes, this can have um, an effect on um, the treatment and it can have um, in, in effect regarding um, the screening for organ involvement and for the um, interdisciplinary care for the um, patient. So um, we should always aim um, at a precise diagnosis. We should always aim to make um, um, the, uh, the correct diagnosis of the subset of myositis. And we should not just say, well, it's myositis or unspecific. We should always try be um, as precise um, as possible. Any additional comments? This is a, a little bit a, a thought that was shared already, uh, which is the importance of biopsy. So the biopsy features in the amount of myositis are different than polymyositis itself. But sometimes that's felt it's not to be necessary at the beginning and, and then as the course of the disease uh, progresses, uh, that idea is revisited. So um, I agree with what Jen said completely that uh, sometimes with the same team, uh, the diagnosis over time can change. Thank you, Wayne. Um, 
maybe we should switch to the other window. Yen, Jens, there was one yes. real interesting question there. I, sure. I, I mean, there are lots of interesting questions, but um, one that came up that was, uh, is there a way to just turn off the immune system? And why don't we just do that? And uh, uh, it's an interesting question and you wonder why we can't, but our immune system, unfortunately, is very complicated and we need it. Uh, does anyone else want to co comment on why it's so important, even with the presence of an autoimmune disease to have a functioning immune system? I mean, so even with the not turning it off, but the reduced infection, reduced immune system we cause with the immunosuppressive medications we use a lot, the risk of infection is, is one of the major risks with most of these medicines. So doing that to a higher degree is something to, to keep in mind. And in the therapies where people do shut off the immune system, so transplant patients, um, severe lupus where patients may get cytoxin, um, either followed by or not followed by, you know, stem cell replacement, um, there are real side effects from that. You know, there are real, there are significant risks um, and there can be significant long-term risks as well from that. So it's certainly something that is done in some diseases, uh, but given the therapies we have now for myositis, lots of these other things carry out significantly less risk um, and are effective at what they can do. Um, so like everything else we make, it's a risk-benefit analysis. Yeah, I think it, it will be difficult to um, completely switch off the immune system. So it, maybe we should um, aim to, ref to rephrase this to a resetting of the immune system and maybe to change uh, the, um, the basic, the, the, the fundamental basis of an individual immune system. So to reprogram it. Um, any other um, important question that um, I might have overlooked? Otherwise I would um, go on. Um, the next question would be, what have we learned from previous failures in clinical trials in IMNM? I think this is um, a difficult uh, question um, because the, um, the trials that we have seen so far um, it's, it's a matter of really dissecting the different uh, myositis subsets. And um, I cannot recall having seen um, really a phase three study with um, a sufficient number, um, a convincing number of um, IMNM patients so that we could really say that the treatment design has failed. Um, I think all of what we have seen so far were pilot studies, smaller studies, so that it's difficult to really um, say if something um, should have um, worked and then failed. At least that's um, how, how I perceive the uh, previous studies. And I see nodding, so maybe we should um, move on. What suggestion do you have to help me with a diagnosis? I'm being treated for polymyositis with monthly IVIG, prednisone, and methotrexate, but I have not officially been diagnosed since all the tests um, I've taken have come back insignificant. I've already been to Mayo Clinic for a second opinion and then looking to find somewhere else to go for help in diagnosis. Thank you. Would anybody like to comment in terms of second opinion? I think this is always a good idea, no matter um, who's your primary um, center. And I think um, one, at least we always do that in our daily um, care. We encourage patients uh, to seek advice um, at um, other centers. I think if, um, if you're doing a good job, then um, you don't have to worry that uh, patients um, go somewhere else as well. And um, so we see patients um, who have been treated at other sites. So I think this should be a normal 
um, situation, um, like referral, uh, referral to other um, centers should be normal. Yeah, I think second set of eyes and another view when things are hard to figure out is always helpful. And I think we're particularly lucky in the world of myositis that not only do we have different centers, but we have lots of different specialties who focus on myositis. And there are subtle differences in how a, a dermatologist and a neurologist and a rheumatologist may view the disease you have and how they may go about evaluating it. So not just getting a different center, but different specialty that looks at it as part of that may just lead to different new new views that better reflect what's happening for you. Thank you. Um, Along the line of what's been said, um, I just uh, would uh, encourage people to be wary of providers that discouraged second opinions. Um, they may not agree or have the same take on what's going on with the other opinions, but um, uh, good providers do not discourage um, patients from getting other opinions. Thanks, that's a very clear statement. And I think we all have the same um, attitude, which I think is very, very good. Um, I have anti-SRP and I'm wondering if there's a way to find out um, how I got my disease. My neurologist tells me that there is not a way to find out. I think this is true. Um, we don't know any cause of any of these um, myositis substances. We know that um, at least all the knowledge that we have so far um, tells us that there is a misdirected um, autoimmune system and that there is inflammation that is sustained by our um, immune system attacking the um, vessels and the muscle um, fibers in the skeletal muscle. But even if we have identified a certain autoantibody, we do not know precisely what this antibody does, is it the primary, is it the primary event, is it the secondary um, event? Um, so this is difficult. Any additions from anybody? So it's gonna be a, a combination of things. We know that the genetic risk for myositis exists, uh, but it's not the whole picture just from the you know identical twin studies and other avenues. Um, and we know there are environmental risk factors for myositis. When you look at sun exposure and UV exposure, certainly that's a risk for dermatomyositis versus polymyositis. Um, it's been shown in several different studies uh, from other groups across the, the world. Um, but it's not one or the other. It's going to be some combination. And, and as was said earlier, when we talk about myositis, we're probably talking about not just one disease, but many. So sorting out that particular environment and gene interaction that's leading to disease in one person uh, is somewhere I think we'd all like to get because the goal isn't just to cure it, it's to stop it from coming and prevent it. Uh, but figuring out how to do that is going to take some work and time. So if I may add, I agree with everything was said. So the, the difficulty, and I'm sure that the, the person asking the question would like to know what the trigger was for, the, for their disease. And, and the problem is, going to, is that the trigger for the disease is, as, as Adam said, the, it depends on genetics, but it varies from one individual to another individual. So the trigger for one person is going to be different than the trigger for another person because their genetics are different. So someday we'll be smart enough and we'll have enough data to be able to figure out what trigger triggers certain genetic backgrounds, but we're not there yet. So maybe we um, move back to the chat questions. Um, to follow up on my earlier question, would you be inclined to reduce methotrexate first or lengthen the time of infuser, infusions? I think this is um, a very detailed question, which um, probably can only be answered on an individual one-to-one uh, -one basis by the uh, team of experts that uh, care for the patient. At least I would be inclined to answer like that. I don't see any other reaction. And uh, the next question would be, can myositis affect one side of the body more than the other? I think we have um, discussed this already that 
um, particularly, for example, in IBM, it's um, very typical that we see an asymmetric um, affection. The next question would be if we can talk about new treatment that is being tried. I think we have um, attempted to address this point um, quite extensively. We cannot provide any more details. Um, then a longer question. I'm diagnosed with IMNM and dermatomyositis in 2019. Tried um, several oral and IV treatments, but I'm currently taking cyclosporin and prednisone, tapering now on four milligrams and getting IVIG infusions every four weeks. Upper body strength has improved, lower body strength remains about the same, but not progressing. CK remains elevated about 5,000, was up to 12,500 early on. Is this of concern? So this um, goes back to the, um, question we had earlier regarding the CK level. If um, a patient improves the CK level, um, can um, have a secondary um, or could be viewed as uh, not the primary um, parameter to, um, of concern. I don't know if we need to provide a more specific answer. Um, if you got a patient initially being diagnosed with PM and treated for it, but now have discovered through antibody testing to have NM, how would you change your treatment? I think um, this is an interesting question. So a patient has PM and then antibody um, identified and the um, diagnosis um, is changed. So what does it tell us? Maybe I should um, start. Um, so I think the question is if the patient is stable or has really improved. Um, if this is the case, um, maybe we do not need to act immediately. Um, but if the patient, for example, um, has not improved, um, then we might be more lenient to add more drugs from the humoral um, system, for example, IVIG or um, rituximab. So this would be um, my answer to that. By the way, I think um, the, is the session end at, um, at this hour now, or do we have another half hour? How strict is the, um, the end of the session? Do we have another couple of minutes? We have more time. We, we have more time? Okay. I think so. Okay. So, Okay, there is a chat um, for you, Eric, regarding uh, someone would like to have the um, presentation and uh, provided the email, if you could please copy that. Then I would, again, I would like to have a copy of the presentation. Yeah, I sent out an email. Yeah. I also am gonna check with TMA if that, can be streamed on the site. I can send out the presentation. It'd probably be more helpful if people could listen to the recording of that. I think it was taped, you know, because it was over Zoom. So we'll look into that and um, get. I'll get back to everybody, definitely. Thank you, that's an excellent suggestion. Um, and then maybe the last question that I see at the moment in the chat window, um, or no, the two last ones. Can a patient have both PM and DM? This is a difficult uh, question. So probably nothing is impossible. Um, you can 
have um, a stroke and heart attack at the same time. So why not have two subsets of myositis um, at the same time? Theoretically, this is possible. Personally, I would be more um, lenient to believe that either PM or DM would be a true, um, but um, I leave it to the others maybe to, to also comment on this. I think it, you know differentiating whether you have PM and DM or one of the others is probably a research linguistics issue. Uh, so we have that we have research criteria where you couldn't have both. Um, you, there, there's a there's a re rash requirement and the ACR ULAR criteria and in Bohan Peter criteria. And if you have that, you're in one box. If you don't have it, you're in the other box. Um, can so, but can somebody have a you know a biopsy that looks one way? And looks like PM, but then has a rash of DM. Yes, that that certainly can be true. And then it's just a it's a question about what diagnostic criteria you're going to look with. And those are built for research, not for clinical care. We have lots of people who, you know, the their rheumatologists come have labeled them as DM. They see us and we say, your your doctor's fully right. You have lots of rash and muscle disease but you don't have the rash I'm looking for today. So I wouldn't call you DM by research criteria. That doesn't mean that they're not, they don't act like a dermatomyositis patient. It's just, they're not meeting right research criteria on that day at that time for dermatomyositis. Yeah. So I think there are two questions actually in this question. So the one is, can I have a patient the both diagnosis, polymyositis diagnosis and dermatomyositis diagnosis? And or can have some can someone really have a true myositis inflammation in the muscle and at the same time a dermatomyositis uh, inflammation in the muscle? So I think um, both of us have answered in um, um, or we both have answered these two different questions which um, are harbored in this one question. So I think um, it will be less less common to have two subtypes in the same individual, but it's not impossible. So can you describe what a PM team may look like? I just have a rheumatologist that I have not seen physically for over a year. I am in um, California, is there an actual center for PM? Um, yeah, I know that uh, particularly in um, rural areas and um, um, in situations with long distances, it may be really um, difficult to have an interdisciplinary um, treatment center. Um, however, um, all of us, um, like today, are quite experienced now with um, uh, telemedicine and with um, talking and discussing and meeting um, by video. I think this could be also a way to go in the clinics. So I think multidisciplinary clinics um, could potentially use such tools in order to bring together clinicians from different um, specialties. Um, personally, I think it would be um, useful if patients could be seen by different specialists um, initially, particularly. Um, and then depending on the subset of myositis, maybe uh, the dermatologist takes over for the patients with uh, dermatomyositis and uh, the rheumatologist, for example, for patients with polymyositis and maybe the neurologist for patients with inclusion body myositis. But um, if things don't work well, um, if the treatment um, fails or if the disease changes over time, I think it will be important to go back uh, to the initial um, conference between the specialists and come together on one table and discuss, okay, is the diagnosis correct? Uh, what, how can we change the treatment and um, which organs are involved? And personally, I would very strongly advocate um, to attempt to um, bring together specialists for the daily care. If everything is stable and the treatment works and the patient is well, this is much, um, much less needed, but particularly in those situations where the situation 
is not satisfying for both the physician and the patient, I think this could be a, a tool um, to move forward. Maybe I can add also, I, I agree with the, with, the, with the opportunity to meet the team in the beginning of the disease, because you also need to learn how to, I mean, you, you see your doctor or your, your team maybe an hour at the most a year, uh, and all the other hours of the, of the year you take care of yourself and you need to also learn the self-care um, to, to handle your daily activities or your daily life. Um, and as we have also stated today, it's very important to, to get started with your exercise if you had, if you don't have that in your routine before, it's very important to start early. Uh, so I think from my perspective, of course, as an occupational therapist, I would also suggest uh, the meeting of an OT in the beginning. So you get to learn all the, the tools that you can use in your daily life to make sure that you have a meaningful um, daily activities and continue working or whatever it is, what it's important for you. So, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so all of us uh, truly agree that uh, this is very important, but it um, can be challenging um, to really achieve this. Um, so why is it that myositis diagnosis and treatment is so individual from person to person? This is from the Zoom chat. Um, I think um, many of the aspects why this is so um, different, I think we have touched upon those. Um, myositis, um, unlike other diseases, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, it's the bowel system that is um, affected. And in myositis, um, the disease does not stop from affecting other organs as well. So we have a multi-organ disease, um, the heart can be affected. Um, of course, the skeletal muscle mostly is affected, but may not be even affected. The skin is affected. So many organs um, can be affected. And the treatment efficacy for each of these organs um, can be different. So this is why, um, and of course, the lung is an important organ. I should not forget this. Um, and uh, uh, this makes it so challenging uh, that uh, the disease can be so different from um, patient to patient and the treatment needs to be so different just as well as the disease differs. Um, in the QA, we had questions regarding, for example, stem cell treatment in necrotizing myopathy and COMPATH uh, treatments. Uh, someone says um, that, uh, that there was a treatment uh, for 15 um, years, uh, no, 15 years remission after treatment with um, COMPATH. We do not know the diagnosis. Um, so we don't know if this was, um, for example, IBM. And um, are there any uh, drugs comparable? Um, with uh, this drug. So I think this is something that we have discussed um, um, at least um, partly. So maybe someone would like to add on to our previous discussion regarding alentuzumab and um, attempting to um, reset the immune system because alentuzumab would um, block T cells and B cells. No, there's much to add to that, but I mean, the idea of resetting the immune system is, is an idea that is very uh, commonly thought of all, in all autoimmune diseases. And obviously, sometimes it works fabulously. It gives patients 15 years of, of uh, time with disease and remission, which is fabulous, uh, but sometimes it does not work so well. And so, uh, but this is an area, obviously, that the 
require a lot more research to know how, what subsets of, of myositis this works very, very well for, and which subsets it, it works less well for. But uh, it's obviously a, 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 an interesting approach to many autoimmune diseases. And um, maybe in combination with the subsequent um, question, which I um, also uh, read out before regarding stem cell treatment and uh, necrotizing myopathy, any specific thoughts on this? Well, there, there was one trial that was going on at Northwestern University where they've done quite a bit of work with doing stem cell transplants for autoimmune diseases, particularly in, in um, multiple sclerosis. And they had a study um, in stem cell transplantation in, in idiopathic inflammatory myopathy. And, um, you know, it sounds like it could be a great, and I don't know that this is the last word on that, on that, um, on that potential treatment, but they had to stop the study early in 2018 because there were very high rates of relapse despite the uh, you know, when we talk in stem cell in, in that sense, I should be more specific is a bone marrow transplant with wiping out the immune system, like Adam had mentioned, and then replacing it. And uh, in, in that, that's the largest study I'm aware of trying that. Uh, the patients would go through this very difficult process. And despite that, there were high rates of reoccurrence of the myositis, so it didn't seem to be a good treatment in that study. Yeah, I put it in the chat for, or the question and answer, but there was this, I, I, not really a study, but a, a review from the Hopkins cohort uh -huh. uh, where they did five patients with high dose cytoxin without stem cell transplant. So it's patients who basically got the stem cell transplant regimen of high dose cytoxin uh, and didn't get, actually get the transplant side. Uh, and some of them with necrotizing myopathy did well. Um, again, uh, the side effects were relatively significant here. And that's what we talk about with the immune system going that low. So it's not something that one would do as a first, second or third line choice, um, but it is there. And it's something that has been used with success in some people. Thank you. Um, what is the likelihood that someone with PM develops to have IBM or necrotizing myopathy in percent? I think that depends on who you ask and what study you're going to look at and a view of the world of where, where these diagnoses overlap. Um, we certainly have had patients who we think have had uh, PM and then later gone on to IBM and, you know, have PM at an age of, you know, their young 20s um, and then ha and have biopsy proven disease and have IBM that develops in their 50s and looks very much like IBM and biopsy proven IBM. Uh, I think a lot of people would question whether their first diagnosis was right, though, in these patients where PM exists and then they're called IBM or necrotizing myopathy later that either the biopsy was missed for necrotizing early on or was misdiagnosed and it really was IBM and unusual looking. Um, but I think that a lot of where you fall depends on what you think about whether they really exist as PM at the start or not. Yeah, maybe such conditions um, early onset um, difficult uh, to make a diagnosis, such conditions could potentially um, lead to um, the, at least to consideration of doing genetic testings um, in selected patients. Um, this needs to be um, discussed very well. Um, and if the treatment works and we are sure that someone hasn't really primary immune mediated condition, then uh, this is not necessary. Um, but if it's a very unusual case and the treatment fails, I think um, it is justifiable to do genetic um, testing because there are, um, we have seen many uh, mimics of um, chronic myositis. Um, being a neurologist, we see many 
the hereditary myopathies and um, sometimes the histologic um, appearance um, can be um, very, very similar um, from a hereditary myopathy and an autoimmune mediated myopathy. So sometimes it's worth to do genetic um, testing if it's um, a puzzling um, disease cause. So there's another question regarding PM and DM. And I think we have seen a similar um, question in the chat and we have answered that. Um, can Avara cause infections, especially after total knee replacement? Would someone be able to comment on that? Sure, I'm happy to comment on that. So Areva is just like many other immune suppressive medication, increases one's risk of um, infection in general. So uh, this is that anytime someone is on immunosuppressive medication, they are taking additional risk. And there is definitely a risk with all these medicines. Thank you. I would have a question. I think we discussed many treatment modalities so far. We've seen in the quest, in the chat um, and in the questions, we have seen many treatment modalities. So far, we haven't seen anything regarding plasma exchange. Um, I would like to hear the, the board's opinion uh, regarding the efficacy of plasma exchange. Um, would anybody dare to comment on that? Everybody's smiling. Well, yes. Uh, well, if nobody wants to talk, I'll talk. I'm never uh, limited in my ability to, to speak. So, I mean, the plasma exchange is one of those things, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I have definitely used it, but I consider it the last frontier. Uh, I basically uh, have had patients in the ICU who, uh, on a ventilator, and I've tried everything in the book to try to get them to feel better and do better. And when that fails, I'm, I'm the, the one that's making the strongest act, argument that they need plasma exchange. So, so I, we use it, but it, it, the data is all over the map and uh, basically uh, it's the last resort. Yeah, it's difficult to use as a long-term therapy because of the time involved in the extent of intravenous or IV access, which is a very, you know, we all have native flora that are helpful bacteria on our skin and plasma exchange in particular, you have an extended um, duration or extended length of time with a IV catheter or, or large catheter um, you know, entering your bloodstream through your skin while you're usually on multiple other immunosuppressants at the time that occurs. So the big drawback, a big drawback of it is um, the risk of, of infection because of the route. Yeah. Yeah, I think we, the same thing. It, it's used as a, a treatment at the very, at, when things are very severe often bad lung disease and in the ICU or, or more severe disease. And usually it's not the only thing they're getting. It's they've already gotten a bunch of immunosuppressive medication, some of which takes some time to work. And then you may also get plasma exchange on top of that to see if you, it will help. And if they get better, whether that's the plasma exchange or other things that they got, getting some time to work is hard to sort out. Um, so certainly I would say people can get it and it, it's something to try, but not routine care, you know, for your average person out walking around with myositis. I see another interesting question. Thank you very much, uh, of course, everybody for um, um, speaking on plasma exchange. In my personal opinion, it is um, completely the same. So um, I, I also have mixed emotions uh, regarding plasma exchange, but um, we, we do use it um, as what we think uh, a last resort in selected patients. So um, some PM patients have pain, others don't. Please comment. Uh, 
so I mean, uh, myositis overall, I think traditionally was thought of as a painless muscle disease. And that's the, I think the more traditional teaching. Certainly we see patients with pain. Um, a lot of this, I think we find in patients with myositis is associated not really with their inflammation, uh, but with changes in their posture and other associations with how they're carrying their weight and sort of their athletic work for some of our folks. We do have patients who have chronic pain with it. Um, I don't think we have a good predictor or you know, mechanism for why some patients get this pain and others don't. Uh, there was some work early on that quinolytic acid uh, was present in these patients with myositis and more active disease, which is a neurotoxin, which can explain some of the neuropathic type pain patients may get, uh, but that's never been fully tested in that sort of mechanism. So it certainly happens. It's not the classic description. Um, some of this may be things that seeing your physical therapist may help with uh, on that side as well. Um, but then it's, that's not the case for everybody, I would say. I think it's important uh, for us physicians uh, to really know that pain um, can be um, a very important symptom in myositis and we should um, really listen to the patients that uh, pain um, and the um, good attempt to try um, to reduce the pain um, I think is very important. So mobility is important, of course, resubmission um, of uh, the flare is important. And um, um, pain treatment as well um, is another um, column in the treatment of uh, myositis. Mm, another question from the Zoom chat. My polymyositis was very severe at one point with CK of 22,000 and elevated uh, tryponin numbers, which left me like a quadriplegic. Um, through the recovery, I experienced a lot of edema. Is this common with polymyositis? Edema in polymyositis. Would anybody? like to answer this. Personally, I think that uh, edema often is a secondary phenomenon from, from um, in, impairment uh, and reduced movement. Um, um, if it's something specific to polymyositis, at least I would not have experienced this. So I would... Um, think that there is a possibility that this is a secondary phenomenon due to immobility. Sometimes also the medication can cause uh, retention, fluid retention also, so in addition to immobility. Thank you, absolutely, yes. Someone thanks us um, as the panel to, uh, to answer the questions. You're very welcome. Um, we enjoy this very much. Um, and if any one of you, um, like Ari already uh, did uh, a little while ago, if you see um, a very interesting question, or if you see that I skip a question, then um, please uh, remind me and uh, please go ahead and read the question to us. Um, another question I see here is, can you be on IVIG treatment for long term? This should be an easy, um, and I see everybody uh, nodding, so I think this can be a quick answer. Yes, and we know this from um, uh, many other diseases that um, IVIG um, often is very well treated, uh, very well uh, tolerated, and um, it has been used for decades. Um, as a replacement for immunodeficiency conditions um, so that uh, patients require exogenous IgG uh, replacement. And we um, do see this, for example, in inflammatory neuropathies that patients um, require IVIG and that uh, they uh, can be treated um, literally for decades and uh, tolerate the drug. Yes, this is not a this is not of concern, I would say. And it's uh, if it's required, then it is possible to provide this um, as a long term treatment. Um, 
Um, another question regarding pain. And initially, I had no pain when the disease was at its um, highest point, destroying my muscles. But now that my muscles are recovering or being restored, I have pain due to my muscles being more aware. This is an interesting condition. Would anybody like to comment on this? I would say that this is um, something that can occur. Um, I think this is similar to what we've discussed um, earlier, that there can be a discrepancy between the weakness and the CK and the MRI image and the pain. So it doesn't always go side by side. So um, the, the pain can kick in later during the disease or it can um, occur um, in the beginning. You have another 30 minutes for the presentation. Thank you. What exactly is necrotizing myopathy and is this its own disease process or a result of myositis? So I think this needs, uh, I think this calls for some clarification. Would somebody like to start? Should I start? So maybe the distinction. So um, those of you who uh, watched carefully um, already saw that. So the session is called Polymyositis and Necrotizing Myopathy. And I took the liberty in my slides to name it Immune-Mediated Necrotizing Myopathy, which I think would be the, um, the subset of the disease which uh, we are discussing about. Personally, I think that it would be um, sufficient just to call it necrotizing myopathy, but um, five specialists, five different answers probably. So important is, that there are um, a, a necrotizing myopathy is something that is a histologic diagnosis. A necrosis means cell death. So that means that in the histological workup of a muscle, we see damage, a particular um, pattern of damaged muscle um, cells. And this pattern looks completely different in immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy and in other causes of necrotizing myopathy. For example, we could have um, an infarction, something like a stroke in the skeletal muscle, and we would see a typical pattern of dying muscle fibers. This would also be termed necrosis, but that's not an inflammatory condition. And um, so in other words, what we discuss today is the immune-mediated part of the big family of necrotizing myopathy. And um, why this subset of myositis leads to more necrosis rather than others, we don't know, at least I don't know precisely. So one theory is that there are more antibodies that attack the muscle fibers and leads to the binding of complement, one of the mediators of cell death. And that this is one of the reasons that we see more damage to um, the muscle fibers as we see in other um, subsets of myositis. Um, any other thoughts or comments on this from the panel? Um, so I think you'll get different. People have different opinions on this. I... Is a pathologic diagnosis um, in terms of necrosis on the biopsy. How these diseases get divided up is another question. Um, I, I fall in the avenue of there are multiple ways to describe things, and we've seen this in some criteria 
diagnoses whether necrotizing myopathies are really patients who have necrotizing antibodies like SRP and HMGCR, or whether they have to have a, bio, a natural biopsy uh, with necrosis to identify this. And what do you call somebody who has classic DM rashes, but has a biopsy that has necrosis on it? Um, and what category you're going to put that individual in? Um, to me, the way I usually describe this to patients who come to our clinic is that you can describe in the classic sense where we had PM, DM, IBM, that there, you can describe a bunch of houses as how many windows they have. And you know, does a house have one window, three windows, five windows? Um, or you can describe it, describe it from the biopsy. Is it necrotizing? Does it have predominantly T cells or B cells in the biopsy? And that's telling you whether the house is purple, red, or blue. The house, telling you the house is blue doesn't mean it's also not a house that has three windows. It's just a different way of trying to sort things out. Similarly with the antibodies, that the antibody gives you useful information about your disease, but it doesn't mean that somebody who's MI2 positive is all of a sudden not a dermatomyositis patient. They've now become an MI2 positive patient. It's a different way of describing that particular patient. And as we try to get down to this concept of personalized medicine and things that target an individual, the more of those descriptors and the better we can categorize people the more accurate sort of we can get in predicting it. So there's useful information, I think, in all of these adjectives that we give to patients, and they're not mutually exclusive. Somebody can have more than one thing describing them. Um, so I think that's part of how to look at this. The way necrotizing myopathy in the myositis world is, is done, and I think Jens is right to point out that, you know, if you look at the, the coding criteria for this, um, necrotizing myopathy due to like trauma or infection is what most of those are focused on. So you have to be clear that we're talking about immune mediated necrotizing myopathy um, is there. And it's something that we're, we're figuring out and figuring out whether there are treatment options that are different for it um, and better understanding that interaction now um, as it's one of the newer entities we've started to talk about and really appreciate. Thank you very much for your excellent thoughts on this. Um, so probably we can move on to the next question. I would go to the QA window. Um, what causes PM or DM to go into remission? I can uh, answer that. Um, so uh, basically the, the goal of, of treatment is to get the immune system that is misguided, overactive, to essentially uh, uh, downregulate its activity and, and basically be more directed to the functions that the immune system is, uh, should be doing, which is helping the patient fight infection. So, um, so most of our therapy right now does the first thing, which is suppress the immune system. Uh, and, and get it to uh, have less function in general. And that obviously results in increased risk of infection, which we have discussed multiple times during this, this uh, time. Uh, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to redirect the immune system. So essentially turn on the undesirable responses and make it uh, more doing the function it's supposed to. And that's the hope for the future for uh, treating these diseases. So essentially how the disease goes in remission, the answer is there are multiple factors and some of them are patient driven, not even therapy driven. Uh, so, uh, but overall it's suppressing the immune system to make it uh, calm the immune system down so that we can actually have a remission. Thank you very much. Um, please comment on treating NM with ILD. This is um, really a completely neglected uh, um, area or a neglected area of today's discussion. Uh, discussion. So if this uh, wouldn't have been brought up by a question, I would have also liked to um, ask this. So I think ILD is um, interstitial lung disease is an important area in myositis and really requires um, specific attention, both um, in terms of um, diagnosing, in terms of um, and treatment. Um, so this is, I think, um, 
thank you for this um, question. This is very important. So would um, um, someone like to start the discussion maybe? I mean, so I, you know, ILD, we often will go for Cellcept or methotrexate is one of our first choices. Methotrexate is controversial because there's, there, there, as lung disease is a side effect, but in other ones we've seen good benefit. And there are some studies for methotrexate in interstitial lung disease, um, along with steroids uh, and IVIG as we're going through this, uh, you know, as sort of agents that we will treat for the lung uh, to go after more aggressively, uh, particularly the IVIG because the onset of action is so quick that they can get, patients can get a benefit uh, quite early. I think this uh, very much depends on the cause of the ILD and if, it's, uh, if it can be um, controlled um, with the measures that um, you just mentioned, um, if it's, um, a very rapidly um, progressive um, cause, then um, um, often we might um, require even more aggressive treatment, um, such as um, um, cyclophosphamide. Um, would you agree? Yes, very much so. I, I think, and we with before Celsius, we use that more frequently. Now we, we're using it after the Celsius, but yes. Uh, I think cyclophosphamide is a, a good agent there for lung disease. Again, most of these studies for ILD have large groupings with patients from lots of different backgrounds and reasons to have ILD. Um, so knowing which one is the, the right choice for myositis patients in particular uh, becomes difficult just from a numbers game and the way they're combined in the research studies. But yes, I think that's right. And then there are lots of new agents that are targeted just at ILD that um, I don't think we have great answers for yet, but some of those look promising, like antifibrotic agents um, for ILD in general. You know, we talk about um, the PPIs, so the proton pump inhibitors, um, not just for acid reflux, which can be a risk for ILD, but there were um, at least some studies that had come out saying that there were they were impacting um, actual receptors in the lungs themselves and helping with remodeling. So outside of people who even have heartburn that there might be lung beneficial effects. Um, there we worry about the osteoporosis in our particular patient population for myositis patients, uh, but another agent to consider. So targeting the disease overall with medications that we know impact the lung and then thinking about things to help with, on the fibrosis side as well. Um, and that I think is where a lot of the newer medications are coming from. Thank you very much. Um, so um, Eric Ensrud uh, excused himself because he had other commitments. Um, we thank him very much for participating and um, several people expressed their thanks. Um, you're very welcome. Um, there are um, a few, this is another, um, I think, important um, area. Have you seen your patients who have had COVID-19 infection drastically changed in regards to their myopathy? As in harder to treat or different um, complications, I had severe COVID and was on a ventilator for 10 days. When I woke up, I had nerve damage on leg, no feeling to touch, but burning and pain deeper. The area keeps spreading and getting larger. Any thoughts? I think this also is a, um, an area which we haven't touched before today. So I think um, this is an, an interesting um, question. Would like to start. I mean, I, I basically think that this is a, a very sort of a change. Like, I, I have seen COVID 19 in, in, in quite a few patients with autoimmune diseases, but not specifically myositis. And so, there's a lot of, of, of things that are related to COVID specifically that probably happens to most patients, regardless of what other underlying disease problems they have. And I'm not, I'm not sure there are things that have particularly happened more so in patients with myositis because of COVID or not. I, at least 
I personally don't have uh, any information on that subject, and maybe some of the rest of you have some information specific about that issue. Maybe it would be interesting to hear from um, from you, um, Adam and Well, if if you have seen patients uh, with a myositis who presented with myositis due to COVID. Um, there are very few reports on patients with such a condition that um, it's like a COVID associated um, inflammation of the muscle. Have you seen such patients in your clinics? Um, we have, and if they're out there listening, we'd really like to see them. Um, so I think you have to separate this out. So there are patients, you know, we know the side effect profile for patients with many autoimmune diseases from reasonable studies that have come out. Um, there are limitations and these have all been sort of put together quickly due to the rapidity that COVID beset us. Um, show that the side effect profile in autoimmune patients and normal pa and healthy patients is relatively similar to vaccine um, and to COVID infection. Um, and you know, some of the symptoms certainly overlap between worsened myositis and COVID. Uh, there's a difference, just like we talk about with the statins, that there's a difference between statin-induced muscle injury, that's sort of that acute injury, and then the immune-mediated disease, which is the longstanding autoimmune process after the statin is stopped. So similarly with the COVID vaccine and infection, um, and particularly infection is what we're seeing, um, whether there is just acute muscle injury from local inflammation or systemic inflammation, um, as the vaccine does what it's supposed to do, which is generate inflammation, um, and patients get myalgias and chills with that, or whether there's a true immune response that's longstanding. Um, the, the COVID hasn't been up with us that long, so you know no one has five-year data to see how these patients have done over time, um, but there's certainly, particularly in the juvenile literature, it seems, um, and we've seen a couple of these patients here, uh, who seem to have developed real antibody positive myositis following COVID infection. And it's one of the groups we're looking to, to get more people from to understand them better about how they correlate with traditional myositis patients and what happens to them. Um, so seems to be a thing that exists. We don't know a whole lot because the numbers are very small uh, to sort out. Thank you very much, Adam. So I think as much as um, we understand today, um, to maybe bring it into a one sentence, there might be um, a threefold association between COVID and myositis. The one probably rare would be a direct cause of an, um, muscle inflammation by the virus. The second would be um, an, 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 a stimulation of a previous existing inflammation due to the virus. And the third would be um, that a patient is just severely ill and requires ventilation and um, will suffer from um, um, worsening of the um, primary, um, of the previously existing myositis due to this um, severe condition, as it would also more curve, this um, patient would have influenza, for example, or would have um, a stroke or um, other severe condition. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question regarding how long after second COVID vaccine should myositis patients get the booster shot? This is difficult and it's... Uh, so well, the data is, is using basically it could be as soon as a month after. So as, as long as you wait four weeks, which technically that's plenty of time for the immune response from the second shot to be generated. So that would be a reasonable time frame. Uh, so if we're talking about booster shot as in the, the booster that everyone is going to get. Actually, I should start by asking a question. Is this the booster that everyone is going to get or is this the booster for people who are on immune suppressive medication require a booster because their immune response is insufficient. Uh, and what my statement was is basically about people who are just getting another booster because they're on immune suppressive medication. Yeah, so I think this is a, a difficult question and I think um, it's also a global and um, 
Well, it's a question um, who should, how early receive, how many um, um, injection possibilities um, if other areas of the world um, haven't received any injection so far. So this is um, a difficult um, question. So, um, and then again, as you said, do we know the, um, the antibody level of a patient um, has this, this been checked and how severely affected is the patient? Um, so I think this is um, something that needs to be um, decided more on a one-to-one -one, um, level. Um, as a rule of thumb, I think that um, if the primary um, immun immunization with um, the, depending on the type of um, vaccine you, you received, um, the one shot or the two shots, um, um, once these have been given, probably um, if the immune system um, would work normally, then probably um, the booster should not be uh, required for the subsequent um, couple of months. Um, but if the immune system doesn't work, either because of um, the immunocompetence is uh, deficient or due to the medication that the patient receives, um, even a third or fourth um, immunization may not um, um, enable a sufficient um, mounting of antibodies. So I think this is um, really not trivial. Female myositis patients, is pelvic prolapse common? Can anybody answer this? Uh, certainly not rampant in the population we see. Uh, I don't know if it's more common than the baseline population, but it's not something that we see a lot of. I was diagnosed with, this is from the QA window. I was diagnosed with poly by muscle biopsy and the only antibody I tested positive for was KU. How does KU antibodies differ from ILD or are they the same? So ILD would be the term for um, the lung disease and KU is one of the um, antibodies that can be associated. Um, so I think um, um, this would be plausible. If you have PM for 11 years and have not gotten ILD, can you hopefully not get ILD? This is maybe difficult uh, to promise, um, but I would tend to say that the likelihood um, is not zero, but I would not see it very likely that um, if you have a stable condition over, um, over a decade already, and you have not acquired ILD, then I would not be worried each year. Um, but still, in theory, it could happen. But I would uh, think that there is um, rather a lower chance. What would the others say? I agree. I think it's usually it happens, you know, in the first couple of years, we usually say after five years, it's pretty rare. Uh, with the exception of people who get treated very quickly, or on immunosuppression at the beginning. So you, we have patients who are on, you know, low dose prednisone for other things before they get myositis, or you know, they happen to be a physician or have a family member as a physician get diagnosed, you know, immediately with a when they develop a rash and get put on prednisone within, you know, and other medications within a month or so of getting a rash. And those people, it may have been that they were sort of predisposed to ILD and just got treated so quickly and never got detected. Um, that's the only group where I really, we, we talk about it being more of a possibility later on. If they really came up off all therapy, 
it could have been something that was in their phenotype. And then the antibodies are very helpful. Um, so knowing what your antibody type also gives you a good idea about whether you you are predisposed to ILD or not. Yeah, and the patient just added um, that Joe one is positive. So, but still, I think this would not change our um, view. Um, even though, of course, we know that JO1 can be as um, can be among those antibodies that are typically associated with ILD, but um, I think it wouldn't um, change our thinking. It might change our thinking about the diagnosis, though. But that's another story. Um, Okay, so at the moment, please correct me. I do not see other. New questions. So I think it's time to wrap up. I think we have um, had a very rich, um, a very stimulating discussion. And um, I enjoyed this um, very much. And I would um, like to ask the panelists, we have another five minutes, if maybe there is um, one or more comments from each of you to add um, something that uh, you would like to convey, then I would give you the chance. And maybe Marlin, you haven't been uh, um, able to respond uh, to uh, uh, those uh, questions or uh, you felt it was not your primary area. So maybe is there anything um, important from your area? I was looking through the, the comments about the pain and because pain was voted into the OMRAC, the um, core domains that should always be measured in clinical trials. And I was thinking about what kind of what pain was. So I was going through it a little bit during the session, as you said, I'm not a physician, so I don't know anything about the, or shouldn't talk about the drugs anyway. Um, so, and I think the comments that, or the, the, the quotes that we got from the focus group that we did was um, more on how the pain affected the people, not so much, it's more of an aching or a soreness. So I was thinking about what kind of pain is common and why people have it or, or don't, but, but the reason it was voted in or the, that it was a big problem is how the pain affected the person. So that was kind of a thing that I wanted Absolutely. to add. Absolutely, thank you very much. Any other comments, Adam? Uh, I would go back to something Malin said so I, uh, earlier, not in this this particular thing, but um, to emphasize strongly, we see, a, you know, we see people from all over and I think, community rheumatologists and neurologists are getting much better at sending people to physical therapy. So over the years, we've seen more and more people going to physical therapy and getting a benefit from it. Um, we still see a disappointingly low number of people go to occupational therapy. Um, and I think in the realm of rehab medicine, there are lots of subspecialties um, that we don't talk about that much and aren't part of medical training for most physicians. Um, and there's, a, I think, a lot that can be done there so that people who have deficiencies from their myositis due to weakness, things they can't do, things that are harder for them, that they really ask not just to see a PT, but also an OT, um, and that a real formal assessment from a rehab medicine physician can open up avenues for things that we don't normally think about as rheumatologists or neurologists that, that are available um, and can make huge differences in patients' lives just pointing things out to them. Um, so to, to really emphasize that as an important step. Thank you very much. Well, one minute. You're still muted, please. I, I echo Adam's uh, comments and Marlon uh, regarding the team approach to managing our patients. Uh, I think the times have improved tremendously, but there's a lot of ways to go. So I, I think anytime you have questions, talk to your physician, maybe ask for people, another person to get a second opinion from, and, and uh, always uh, there's hope in the future for all of us. Thank you very much. This was um, an excellent uh, concluding um, remark from you, Well, So I thank the TMA for 
um, providing this session. I think it was uh, very informative, uh, very rich also for us physicians. I like all, um, I'd like to thank all the participants. Um, I would like to thank for all these rich um, questions. I would like to thank all the panelists for the excellent discussion and for taking the time um, to uh, um, come together and answer um, in uh, the, um, this excellent um, fashion. Um, thank you all for um, staying and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Bye.